1995, former Brandon Williamson employee Jeffrey Wigand became Big Tobacco's most notorious whistleblower. His decision to go public with confidential company information and his controversial 60 Minutes interview serves as the basis for the film The Insider. It has been named Best Picture by the Los Angeles Film Critics Association. It has also garnered five Golden Globe nominations, including Best Picture, Actor, and Director. Joining me now is the film's director, Michael Mann. His past works include Manhunter, The Last of the Mohicans, and Heat. I am pleased to have him on this broadcast. Welcome. Thank you. Let's talk about this film, The Insider. Um, a, because I was in a tangential way involved in this, uh, because the, the real-life characters appeared on this program, as you well know, and sat at this table, yeah. as you well know. That, number one. Number two... I am of the 60 Minutes family in mm -hmm. 60 Minutes 2, and I, my loyalty goes to 60 Minutes uh, because I believe in loyalty. Having said that, and I have certain quarrels with the film, mm -hmm. uh, and Mike has more than, than I do, and, and, um, but in the end, this was a film, and this was a creative endeavor by you uh, that works as a movie, uh, mm -hmm. which is what you were making, a movie. Having said all that from me, tell me, how you first uh, speak to what the movie is about for you and what you wanted to do, why this was attractive for you, and what was in yeah. it beyond entertainment. The, uh, the real appeal to, this, of, uh, to me of, of the film was, was, to, uh, was, to, was to involve audience in very, as intensely as I could do into characters who were... Um, were, were very real. And the, uh, uh, the kind of awkwardness of Jeffrey Wigand, I was stunned by the um, humanity of it, the, just the, the raw humanity of it. And, uh, and so it was to bring Jeffrey Wigand onto, onto, onto the screen as a character and to see if I could get an audience to be fused as, as, as subjectively relates to, Jeff, to Jeffrey as possible. That was the motive to do it. And then with Lowell Bergman, who um, uh, doesn't back down, he doesn't back off, he doesn't fade the play. And both men who are, who are as, as, as polarized from each other as possible, uh, both struggling against very large size adversaries. That, that's the real emotional and dramatic and intellectual appeal of, of, of the material that I thought was you know, so stunning. And in that also is probably the subject of the film because, um, because we, that, that, it, that is the nature of our lives. If, if we are in conflict, as these people are, with large corporations, uh, to have an adversary, to have damage, which is the, the wages you pay to take the positions that Lowell and, and, and Jeffrey took, to be how it truly is. And, and uh, if someone, you know, is an adversary of a Brown and Williamson tobacco company or any large Fortune 500 company, those are some of the reasons why I went through the picture. And somebody says, what's this movie about? You say it's about? It's about standing up, about not fading the play, about, about not, not backing down regardless of the, of the uh, you know, of, of the costs. And it's about the way we are. Yeah. We are like Jeffrey Wigand. Yeah. All right, let me talk about that choosing the actors you chose. Yeah. Lowell Bergman. Uh, producer at 60 Minutes. Where is he now? Lowell works for Frontline, and he's also, uh, he also is, writes for the New York Times. Mm. Um, and lives in Berkeley, which he, where he always lived. Even when he was doing 60 yeah. Minutes, he lived in Berkeley. Al Pacino, first and only choice for, to play Lowell First Bergman. and only choice. Simply because you love Pacino, or simply because you thought there was something about this role was because right I for Pacino? thought it, it would be great to have Al play a character he's never played before, which is which is a, a, an intellectual worker, right? A journalist, a man who is um, who is world wise, who is as facile in dealing with uh, the Hezbollah in Lebanon as he is dealing with uh, police corruption in New Orleans, as he is dealing with. The Leaf Blunders Manual from Brown and Williamson. And he's never played that kind of a character before. So the idea of bringing Al to that character, uh, I thought it would be very exciting because it would be very fresh for both of us. Uh, Russell Crowe as Jeffrey Wigand. That was very different. Uh, that was, I, when I said I wanted to use Russell Crowe, I got some of the same kind of reaction I did when I said I wanted to use Danny Day-Lewis and Last of the Mohicans. Hmm. 
because all anybody had seen of Daniel was... It, Russell Crowe is... Australian. Australian. He's 33 years old. Right. He's not American. He's not from the Bronx. And then by way of university, mm-hmm. living in Louisville... He not have a PhD in anything. A PhD in anything. And uh, uh, so it was, it, was, it was not a choice. When we sat down, he said to me, I said, I don't know why I'm here. And... Uh, <laughs> And I'd flown him down from, uh, from Canada. He was working on Mystery Alaska. And he had a beard, and it was his one day off. And any actor on the one day off, he's doing two things. He's, he's recharging his batteries. He's trying to divest himself of all of last week. And then he's trying to orient himself to all of next week. So if he's any kind of an actor, he's going to, be, he's going to do terrible in a reading on that day. And we sat around the table, just as you and I are sitting right here, and only the two of us, and we read two, three hours, and I thought this is going absolutely nowhere. And uh, we hit one scene, and Russell, uh, Russell, uh, it, it's a scene in which Russell learns that the interview he taped is never going to air. And he's lost his family to speak out. And he, uh, he said, you mean, you mean what, I, what I taped is what I'd interview, everything I had to say, uh, uh, which would have meant something to my kids is never going to see the light of day. And as you said, I'm never going to see the light of day. He just sunk. I can't imitate him. He just sunk. That day in that room with you. That day in that room with me. And I just felt, I f- didn't see, I felt the, the inner annihilation uh, of, of this man. And in that moment, sometimes as directors, you know when you know, and I just knew that this, this is it, this is the guy. Well, did you tell him at, at that moment? Or did you say, I'll re- reserve judgment and... See if my instincts are right. He knew I felt that this is that this is it. Yeah. And was yeah. he excited about it? Uh, he went back to <laughs> he went back to uh, Alaska. I think he was. I I never asked him that. He I would imagine he would have been confounded by it because why am I you know very and he's very Australian. Um, Christopher Plummer is not yeah. even an American. Right, he's Canadian. Right. Yeah. Mike Wallace. Plays Mike Wallace. Plays Mike Wallace. One and only choice because of a bearing, a dignity, a there's sense a, of integrity or something. There's a terrific, uh, hey, he's an immensely skilled actor. I've wanted to work with, with yeah, Chris sure. Plummer since uh, you know, Royal Hunt of the Sun. Uh, <laughs> there's a, when was that? That was in the 70s. Yeah. Okay. There's a picture, I believe it's Stage Door, directed by Lumet that he did in the, I believe it's the late 50s or the early 60s. Yeah. And we, I was talking to Al about, what about Chris Plummer? He said, you know what, go see this early in the Met picture because that is truly uh, what Chris Plummer could do. And what Al was talking about was nobody in this film performs. The, 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 the drive, the attempt was to, was to drive people into uh, kind of non-performance, non-acting. And that's a very internalized process. And in many ways, being expert on stage and theater is, 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 is the opposite of that. Right. So what I really wanted to see was that very internalized performance. It was there in this film. It's a wonderful film. All right, take a look at this. This is Lowell Bergman when he goes to playing a 60 Minutes producer. Oh, he is a 60 Minutes producer, played by Al Pacino. He goes to talk to Jeffrey Wigand about his willingness. Wigand is a... Uh, Head of research for Brian Williams, what was his job? He was corporate officer, and, and he was the head of research and development. All right, roll tape, and this is where the producer tries to talk to the research scientist with important information about what he's going to do. While you've been looking around some f***ing company golf tournaments, I've been out in the world giving my word and backing it up with action. Now, are you going to go and do this thing or not? Um, best performance in this film is by? Oh, I would never say that. Oh, come on. <laughs> what does Al think? I, I can tell you that I think the best performances in this film are by Al Pacino, by Russell Crowe, by, mm-hmm. all the way through Diane Van By Christopher Plummer, by Chris Plummer, Bob, Bob, Bob. Uh, Sir Michael Gambon. Yeah. As, as oh, man, he was great. No, he was, he, I mean, he had him. one scene to personify something, and it had to be someone with the size of Gambon. Yeah. Since uh, we've talked about it, uh, this is later in which Russell Crowe, playing Jeffrey Wigand, in preparation for a 60 Minutes piece, is interviewed by Mike Wallace, played by Christopher Plummer. Here it is. 
There is extensive use of this technology known as ammonia chemistry. It allows for the nicotine to be more rapidly absorbed in the lung and therefore affect the brain and central nervous system. This movie seems to have had everything a good movie needs to do big time box office mm -hmm. business. A very good director, very good actors, uh, contemporary story, conflict, and controversy played out on the front pages of magazines and newspapers or featured in the front on, on magazines and newspapers, yet it didn't do well at the box office. Why do you think that is? You know, I don't think people knew what the picture was about. And, I, and the picture is, uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the upcoming nominations and stuff. And hopefully it'll follow the pattern of LA Confidential and may have a second life or a third life here. And it's opening in Europe. And, uh, but I don't know that people know what the picture's about. If someone said to me, would you want to go and make a picture about 60 minutes? Or do you want to go and make a picture that's, that's about don't smoke cigarettes? I wouldn't want to make that picture. I wouldn't want to see that picture. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not the film we made. And so in that sense, perhaps some of the, the controversy hurt us. Um, and it, it's really a question about... Because my, it looked like it was a piece about 60 minutes, or it looked like it was a piece yeah, about yeah. an investigation or, no, into no, no, what's no, it wrong like with it tobacco. Was about, oh, that's something to do with cigarettes, and it's going to tell me smoking cigarettes is bad, and I know mm -hmm. that already. And that's never, it's not what the picture is, it's not what the picture's about. But it's also, your question's kind of an interesting question, it, because it's also a question about, about marketing. Because you, you're opening, we didn't open uh, to the levels that, that any of us wanted, you know, anticipated. And Disney was very courageous to, to finance the picture and back the picture and supported it with, uh, with significant advertising dollars. But I don't know if we ever really were able to get the, um, to get the message of what the picture is in the content of the... Of the of our campaign, and and it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to put into a bottle. It's an art form like haiku. All of course of it own. is because I asked you to tell me what the movie was about about ten minutes ago, and you had a hard time. I could tell what it's about, but if it, it's a complex film, it's about many things. It ultimately is is uh, is is it, it, it's a thriller. It's a psychological thriller, and it's. Um, but it's difficult to get that 30-second message in a bottle sometimes. But, uh, because it's a complicated story. It's a, compli it's a complicated story. Yeah. And then there's also the, uh, it was fraught. I mean, it was a wild time in a way. We were threatened with litigation by Brian and Williamson, so there was nervousness about what materials would be used or not used in, in advertising. But, uh, but it was highly supported. And there's another thing to, to consider is that all the press, all the reviews, as a rule of thumb, I would say, are maybe a 25 to 30 percent factor. And everything else rests on 30-second spots. Reviews were pretty good. Reviews were fine, yeah. Janet Maslin in the New York Times and mm -hmm. others. So you think it had to do with the way the film was marketed? I think it had to do with the way the, uh, with the, a combination of things, but the news environment and, uh, uh, and the marketing. But, but it's and we all and we all took a part in it. So this is, uh, but it's, um, you know. But the marketing of a motion picture is kind of an activity that's off to the side, and the making of it is, is over here. And and uh, so I concentrate obviously more on the making of the film than I do on the marketing of the film. So, Perhaps you know. that's a mistake. I don't. <laughs> well, no. I mean, in a sense, once you I mean because if you care about it, you need to see it through. You do see it through, and you do work on it, but. But it, it, it's a skill set all of its own yeah, and a discipline all of its own. So. I mean, I bet Steven Spielberg sees it through. I think a lot of people see it through. I see it through, but, it's, but how good I am at it, I am not that good at making a 30-second sure. spot. I'm good at making something maybe all the way down to about two and a half minutes which is about how long it took me to answer your question before. <laughs> I could do, I'm okay all the way down to trailers. You yeah. start getting into that realm of 30-second spots, that's a level of expertise all of its own. Would you do it over if you had it to do over? Absolutely. It's, most thrilling, it's, it's the most thrilling uh, experience I've had directing, making this film. Why? Because the challenge of, 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 uh, dry, of, of trying to direct audiences' attention 
into those moments when, for example, Russell as Jeffrey Wigand is experiencing something that's common to our lives. It, it hits a kind of a, a harmonic, and it's, it, it's a universal moment, and as an audience, and as a director, I can look at that when he, and say, I've been there. I know, I know what that man's experiencing. Um, to, I mean, that's, that was the promise of this material, and, with, uh, and that's what Russell delivered. It's what Al delivered. Uh, thinking particularly of the moment when it's the only moment in the whole film in which he's completely candid, in which he's emotionally immediate to the moment, and he tells his wife when they're leaving the old house and going to the new, much smaller house, the life is going to, the material life is going to get significantly reduced. Uh, he says, this, this will be better. Uh, imagine what it would be like for me to come home at the end of the day feeling like, uh, uh, not, not, not feeling bad about where I was and feeling good about it, good about, good about it. Uh, and this will be better, it'll be more organic. That's a great story. That's a great story. Lowell's story is a great story. Jeffrey's story is a great story. Then the moment you're talking about, it, it, it was, it was uh, funny, and, and it gets this issue of, of, of truth, about dramatizations. There was a moment on Dick Scruggs' lawn in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Dick Scruggs is a lawyer who's been on this show who prosecuted the tobacco companies with great skill. Right. And invented how to sue them. Um, and... He was Jeffrey Wigand's lawyer, and they, uh, Jeffrey had to make a, 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 mom, a pivotal decision about whether to go to court and give a deposition or not. If he did, his, uh, he could go back to Louisville and be incarcerated because there was a, there was a confidentiality, uh, thing. confidentiality agreement he was breaking in a court order. If, and he had to make that decision, and uh, he's standing on the lawn, and he came to the conclusion that let's go to court. Now, he's standing on exactly the same spot on the same lawn that the real Jeffrey Wigand stood upon in front of Dick Scruggs' house with Dick Scruggs and Lowell Bergman right there. And it was, it was a pivotal moment. I couldn't find out when we were writing it. What, why did Jeffrey make that decision? Why did he decide to go? Because what was at risk was huge. And um, I came to the conclusion working with Eric Roth, my co-writer on the screenplay, and then also talking to, to Russell about it, I came to the conclusion that he, had kind of, that he decided, uh, if I don't go forward, part of me uh, is going to go away. Part of the way I am to myself, how I see myself, will be annihilated, it's going to go away forever, and then I will be less good to myself, I'll be of no, less value to my kids than anybody. And so he just makes that snap decision. After, and uh, later on, I was able to ask Jeffrey Wigand what was in his mind. And it was, turned out to be the same thing. Later on? You were, later why on. couldn't you do that before you made the... Because we couldn't talk to him. Because he was still under threat of litigation, and he, we couldn't be in a position where information he had was passed to us. Oh, I see. So even so though it may have been what was in his talk. mind at a pivotal moment and right. had nothing to do with the tobacco yeah. company, it could not be used because somebody might suggest... No, we couldn't speak to him at all. No, we had no contact with him in pre-production. All right. To write it. Uh, this is a moment in that may come right after that particular time, but here it is. Because I always wondered that, too, because you, you played up skillfully the dramatic moment. Right. And, I was, and the next thing you know, he's walking in. Well, the next thing you know, he, he says, I have no criteria with which to make the decision, and I can't just do it spontaneously. And then he looks out to the ocean, he comes back, and he says, bleep me, fuck it, let's go to court. And they go, and you know that he's that he's reached something internally, and you, I believe you know why. Roll tape. A response, which meets the definition of a drug. Uh, nicotine is associated with impact, the satisfaction. It has a pharmacological effect that crosses the blood-brain barrier intact. Uh, how much of that was taken from? actual court records a lot in the videotape of the actual deposition ron motley does a very interesting thing in a context if you watch two hours of deposition motley is the attorney ron motley the attorney who's who is uh who's trying to take jeffrey's deposition there's a very interesting thing uh Bizenzen, who was the attorney for brown and williamson constantly is interrupting which is just presents doing his job but Motley decides at one point in time that he's not going to have this anymore. 
and he turns his back to, to the tobacco lawyer and the camera and, and says, sir, I'm going to take my witness's deposition, and you may listen or you may not, and I care not. And it's this mellifluous Southern, uh, yeah. you know, wonderful phrase. In the context of two hours, it was, it was devastating. In the context of a short scene, it becomes Ron Motley with a much more overt, much more overt declaration. Now, Bruce had had surgery about six weeks before that scene. Bruce McGill, the actor playing Ron Motley. And after about four or five takes, he was, wasn't feeling so good. And it turned out, when he went back in the hospital a week later, that he had ripped, literally, oh, had, uh, some stitches came undone. He had to go okay. back in. Um, what's your next film? Not sure. Don't Not know. Sure. Not sure. That's a... I want to do a Western. And Eric Roth and I are launching on uh, writing another Western. But our, our method of working is, is, uh, uh, is so congenial it'll probably take us at least a year. Michael Mann, director of The Insider, will be right back. Stay with us.